Our world is ancient, but the universe is far older. What were those first planets like, and how soon can life emerge on new ones? About one second after the Big Bang, the conditions of the universe were so hot and dense they surpassed a supernova, and in under a minute virtually every particle of hydrogen, helium, deuterium, and lithium that now exists was formed. Things grew less dense and cooler after that, and by 400,000 years after the Big Bang, conditions had settled down to what the surface of a dimmer star would be like. It's ironic that folks think we have problems recreating fusion in the lab because we're trying to replicate the innards of stars, but we are not. Fusion of any given particle in the core of a typical star is the sort of thing that happens less often than once in a billion years. People might envision a house-sized fusion reactor replicating our sun's interior with 100 tons of stellar core matter inside as some powerful juggernaut, but only be able to run a few light bulbs off the fusion energy it was producing, albeit it would run them for billions of years. No, to generate useful power from fusion you need to replicate the conditions inside a dying star, and those are the conditions that forge the matter planets are made of and those conditions lasted only a few brief moments after the beginning of time. Had the universe expanded a bit faster then there'd probably be little helium still and no lithium. Had it expanded much slower than that, we would probably have a universe without any hydrogen to fuel stars, and possibly just a lot of iron and nickel floating around until it turned into black holes. There might have been some different story where conditions after that first minute left us a modest fraction of heavier elements that would have permitted those first stars to have rocky planets around them. There may be realities in which those planets formed even as the first stars were born. But instead, we had to wait for many generations of the shorter lived and bigger stars to live and violently die for those conditions to arise and indeed for the corpse stars, those stellar remnants like white dwarfs and neutron stars, to collide together, as much of the heavier matter in the universe is not birthed by a large star going supernova, but from the violent ends of white dwarfs absorbing matter, or neutron stars merging with neighbors. Today we are going to discuss those first planets, and also what young planets born later in the universe are like. When could the first planet able to support life have formed, and how young can a planet be for us to successfully settle and terraform it. It's a big problem spanning billions of years. We won't need that long to explain it, but we'll still be here for a bit, so settle in, grab a drink and a snack, hit those like and subscribe buttons, and let's journey to the time of primordial planets. Nowadays we discover new exoplanets every day, but in truth we still know little about them and most of the ones we discover are enormous giants, or right by their sun, or often both. Huge gas giants don't interest us much when considering how rocky planets form, as while newer gas giants often have several rocky planets worth of heavy matter in their centers, you only get those exposed for life if they are so close to their sun that they can strip the massive atmosphere off and leave you that remnant. We call those Chthonian planets and the name derives from the idea of an infernal underworld, and these are going to be no more habitable than Mercury is. But you might be wondering if Mercury ever did have an atmosphere, and that's a good place to begin. When a star forms it does so from a local cloud of gas, and the temperature of that gas is quite important. Space is not cold like folks tend to think, and it used to be a lot hotter, and we still have nebulae and gas clouds that can be as hot as a million Kelvin. Even the hydrogen particles of just a few thousand Kelvin are moving thousands of meters per second, and at millions it's more than an order of magnitude higher, so they are not getting captured easily by gravity as a star tries to form. Formation happens better in cooler and denser regions, often ones recently hit by the shockwave of a supernova. Molecular clouds are these cooler and denser regions we get stars forming in, and then make up less than a percent of the galaxy's volume and are mostly packed in from 11,000 to 24,000 light years from the galactic center. We are a bit further out, 26 or 27,000 light years from the center. As a star forms in these, we get other clumps of matter too, and these heavier elements will clump easier as they move slower at the same temperature. Gas speed generally rises with the square root of temperature and drops with the square root of mass so a molecule a hundred times heavier than a random hydrogen particle is moving at a tenth the speed, 
meaning it's a lot easier for it to clump into things rather than bouncing off or evading the rising tug of gravity. Star was formed from a cloud that has a certain makeup, almost entirely that same hydrogen and helium that formed in the first minute after the Big Bang. But when our Sun formed about 9 billion years after the Big Bang, it was a bit under 2% heavier matter by mass. Those particles are all heavier elements, so they actually make up about 0.1% of the Sun's atoms by number. And similarly, 9 out of 10 atoms in the Sun are hydrogen, but only about 7 tenths the Sun's mass is hydrogen and that's been the approximate ratio since the first minute of the Universe. All the heavier stuff is a tiny fraction compared to that primordial hydrogen and helium, and more than half of that remainder are oxygen and carbon atoms, with neon, ion, and nitrogen as distant runner-ups. All these elements heavier than hydrogen and helium are referred to as metals in astronomical terms, and we can roughly gauge a star's age by its metallicity, the percentage of it composed of anything heavier than helium. Metallicity of a given star or nebula is not a precise measure of age by any means, as it reflects the local activity of dying stars and stellar remnant collisions and it is not going to be homogeneous throughout a galaxy or between galaxies either. Stars were originally categorized as Population 1 and 2, where our Sun is a 1 and Population 1 can include stars with a metallicity only a tenth of our own, up to those with a few times more. Population 2 was anything with a lower metallicity than that, less than a tenth of our own, down to only a thousandth, and these are older stars and thus are mostly stars less massive than our own that can live many billions of years. In early astronomy, when we were first figuring this out, we mostly only saw stars bigger than our own and thus called it a yellow dwarf, but we later found out about 95% of all current stars were less massive than our Sun and virtually none of these stars has died yet. This affects metallicity in terms of composition too, as while we usually treat it as a raw value or even estimate it off the ratio of ion or magnesium we see in a star's spectrum, certain elements like carbon and nitrogen are formed mostly in the deaths of lower mass stars that do not go supernova, ones that form white dwarfs after a red giant phase. Stars that go supernova typically live 100 million years or less, whereas no white dwarf could be younger than that and the majority of ion and nickel is from exploding white dwarfs which absorbed matter off a less massive and longer lived binary partner, a type 1a supernova. Whereas magnesium is only made in quantity in supernova of bigger stars, type 2 supernova, and so is oxygen and phosphorus. That's where some of our nickel and ion comes from too, and some of our carbon and nitrogen, but most of that carbon and nitrogen is from smaller stars blowing matter off as they head towards being white dwarfs. These ratios matter because our very first planets probably formed alongside the very first stars, the hypothetical Population 3 stars with essentially no metallicity, and these planets wouldn't have had them either, but as those built up we get higher ratios of metals and greater chance of large rocky planets forming. But elements like carbon and nitrogen, which are pretty critical to life, are going to be at a lower ratio in those oldest planets because most of the stars that would produce them took a lot longer to die and do that. That ratio of heavy elements is probably going to matter, and while metallicity of stars and the nebula planets develop from rises overall with time, it is not constant across galaxies, and the ratio of elements it's made from is not constant either. But rocky planets will form even when the protoplanetary disk it's forming from is fairly low on metallicity. As mentioned, hydrogen and helium are generally moving much faster than other particles and won't clump as easily, so we can't assume the smaller planets formed with the same ratio as that star did, but it is very likely early stage rocky planets all had a thick atmosphere of hydrogen and helium themselves, likely even more so in the more distant past when those metallicity rates were lower. Once that star ignites, a lot of that remaining hydrogen is going to be blown away from that solar system, both whatever was just floating around and whatever was around smaller planets as it just doesn't mass very much and it will be getting hit by solar wind coming out that sun, which are mostly hydrogen atoms that by definition have to be moving fast enough to escape the solar system themselves. Some hydrogen lingers as it bonds to heavier atoms, like oxygen to make water, nitrogen to make ammonia, and carbon to make methane, and heavier molecules too. 
Indeed those three molecules tend to be very common deeper out in the solar system and form the majority of transneptunian and cometary matter. Helium and neon are also very common but don't form molecular bonds and tend to fly away. Argon doesn't form bonds either but is heavier and lingers, it's just not terribly common. How soon was that possible? Well, realistically, only a Population 2 star could have hosted a planet. About the most a Population 3 star would have is one thousandth its mass as metals, and that's the high end, the earliest would have been even lower. Now that's more than enough matter for a planet, but the issue is that it's likely to bend the rough makeup of that initial planetary body itself too. Jupiter's makeup is fairly close to our suns and so is Saturn, while Uranus and Neptune, being smaller ice giants, still are mostly hydrogen and helium but have a much higher ratio of those other secondary but abundant elements like oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Strip any of those down of their hydrogen and helium and you've got a rocky planet, but we believe the core metal of Uranus is only around half Earth's mass, with Neptune maybe at 1.2 Earth's mass, and Saturn and Jupiter both much bigger. What this basically tells us though is that anything big enough to have an Earth mass of rocky materials, while in a system with a tenth or much less of the metallicity of our own Sun, is likely being at least that Saturn mass range and likely higher, and it would be a big stretch to get that massive atmosphere stripped off of any place where a habitable planet would be left over. I could imagine a case where you had a trinary system with two close binaries, with one being a star that might be four to eight times the mass of our Sun and another smaller and a third of star at least several AU away, in a loose orbit of the other two. The bigger one goes red giant, shucks off its outer layer, goes white dwarf, sucks matter off its partner, and goes type 1a supernova, leaving a fairly metal rich system and possibly stripping a lot of hydrogen off some gas giant orbiting our other outer star. Something like this isn't super likely but it isn't strange either, and a universe of billions of billions of stars probably has happened billions of times already. So that's one way you might get a rocky planet fairly early, after that we don't see any Population 1 stars till about 10 billion years ago, about twice our Sun's age, and these are all on the low side of metallicity themselves, in that zone of being a tenth of the metallicity of our Sun or a bit higher. We have a lot of stripping, migration, or ejection methods that could plausibly result in something like Neptune being stripped down to a rocky planet so that I would be willing to say primordial Earth-like planets should have existed as early as 10 billion years ago if not sooner. Let me caveat that by saying a lot of these methods for permitting a low metallicity system to produce a big rocky planet are also not situations or events I think of as being great situations for life to try to exist in. For conceptual purposes, we might find that Earth-like rocky planets formed a hundredth as often 10 billion years ago as 5 billion, when our Sun formed, and were also 1% as likely to be plausibly long-term habitable at their location, and so we only have a 10,000th as many life-bearing planets popping up 10 billion years ago as 5 billion years. But if only 1 in 10,000 systems produced such a planet 5 billion years ago, that means only 1 in 100 million did 10 billion years ago. That doesn't sound like many, but that still means at least a thousand in this galaxy alone. Places where life might have flowered to be building its own spaceship before Earth had even begun forming. And again, we do have potential scenarios like a Population 2 star managing to get a rocky planet by seeing a very large gas giant get stripped down, and maybe even in the first billion years of the Universe though I'd not give it great odds even at the supercluster scale. Gas giants can form anywhere as they have so much mass, but those volatiles and icy bodies all limited to the outer system further out, beyond what we call the frost line, which is at the edge or past our own asteroid belt, and here you get bodies mostly composed of those ices as they are simply far more common. Oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen are very abundant and hydrogen far more so, hence they are simple molecules of water, methane, and ammonia will dominate the makeup of most bodies out past here. Rocky objects in this region can be moons that are captured asteroids from closer in system, or expended comets, or a tightly racked moon like Io near Jupiter that just blew material off, and we can't imagine an Io-like moon, or one a bit bigger, as a potential primordial planet, or primordial moon, as they make a decent candidate for life to emerge on. 
Our default assumption is that a primordial planet, life with a morgeon, has enough size to attain an atmosphere for billions of years while close enough to its sun to get light for photosynthesis and liquid water on its surface. This also suggests an iron-rich molten core helping to generate a protective magnetosphere around a planet. However, I think one can make a good case that a body with a thick ice crust over an ocean, such as one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, is thought to have, might make just as plausible a place for life to begin. There is no firm consensus on the local conditions where life began, or where it did, but the leading candidate for some time is deep sea thermal vents and there is no sunlight there and you would have those on any large icy moon orbiting close to a gas giant. Other candidates are tidal pools, which was the earlier lead candidate and probably gives us a bit of an institutional bias to look for planets with surface ocean and land, though those are better candidates to hunt for complex life, ecosystems, and technological civilizations I think. Cometary bodies themselves have generally been a distant third or fourth candidate for the origin of life, and if true, that really shifts the dynamic on where life emerges. This isn't an episode on panspermia and cometary seeding though, it's on primordial planets, but our main interest here is a place life can emerge at. It's also worth noting that stars begin dimmer and brighten as they age, our sun would have been about 70% of its current brightness on primordial Earth. This gives us a bit of a problem, called the Faint Young Sun Paradox, since Earth shouldn't have had enough sunlight for surface oceans then, but seems to have had them anyway, but we'll return to that in a moment. Let us instead take a moment to consider a large moon around a gas giant out at a distance from its sun that gets lighting similar in brightness to what reaches Mars. It starts as a frozen moon maybe the size of Mars or even bigger, and with subsurface oceans stirred up by tidal forces from its parent gas giant planet, and its seafloor has a lot of nice volcanic thermal vents spewing out the approximate cocktail for life. Life begins there, and as the sun warms up, that ice layer melts from a mix of brighter sun and of rising volcanic land masses breaking the crust and spewing black ash all over the surface, changing it from light reflective clean white ice to heat absorbing black. Those new land masses and ash-covered icebergs start giving life down the seafloor an avenue to crawl up to the surface and get sunlight and evolve photosynthesis. Now to me, that's not particularly more or less likely to be the origin of our first life-bearing planet than an Earth duplicate is, but we need to be mindful that Earth is not the planet it used to be either, so we shouldn't lock ourselves into thinking of modern Earth as the place to go hunting for life. We also need to keep in mind that coincidences often correlate. Whatever might end up as the normal case for where life tends to emerge, that might be the conditions on Planet One as well, but it might be that the first life-bearing planet was a freak anomaly not just in how early life arose there but in its conditions. It also isn't a good idea to assume that it's the first place life got technology at either or that life is still there. We could have an awful lot of tightly racked ice balls out there where life began earlier and where it never got much of anywhere because conditions didn't allow for much of an ecosystem and wasn't robust enough to survive conditions and climate change. And we need to be mindful that conditions really do change. We think Earth is in its third atmosphere at this point, with the first likely having been heavy on hydrogen and helium though likely also rich in water vapor, ammonia, and methane. We believe it got blown away in the collision of Proto-Earth with some smaller planet, which stripped off that atmosphere and from the debris remaining the Moon is thought to have formed. Amusingly, the idea that Earth and the Moon used to be a single body dates back to the late 19th century and was a suggestion by George Darwin, an astronomer and geologist with a heavy interest in the early Earth, which is probably not surprising since he was the son of Charles Darwin. He thought the Moon might have been spun off by centrifugal forces, which was dubbed fission theory, and technically that would be correct in a more explosive sort of context. Fission theory is usually deemed highly unlikely nowadays, but I encountered a lot more as a little kid studying astronomy in the mid-1980s and mostly from my library's collection of outdated kids' astronomy texts, many written in the 1950s. But we knew even then that the Moon's orbit was expanding and it used to be closer to Earth so assuming it used to be even closer wasn't exactly unreasonable. The Moon was also still volcanically active till just over a billion years ago, more than twice the time since life crawled out of the oceans here on Earth. 
maybe a hundred million years after the solar system began, all this settled down, assuming it is correct which we should not take for granted, Earth began acquiring its second atmosphere from a mix of volcanic gases and asteroid and comet collisions. There is a ton of debate still about the composition of this second atmosphere, we just know that it had very little free oxygen. Emphasis on free because the oceans and the very rock we live on are mostly oxygen. It loves bonding to other atoms, so random oxygen floating around as a pair of oxygen atoms forming a gaseous molecule is prone to being absorbed by something, oxidizing it, and thus cannot linger in the air unless the ground is so saturated with oxidized materials there is no place for it to go to. Around 2 billion years ago, oxygen was finally plentiful in the atmosphere, it had grown slowly over eons, and this is the origin of the modern atmosphere and it is basically half the planet's age, and we do not expect an oxygen-rich atmosphere to last more than a billion or so more years. As mentioned, the sun keeps warming up and getting stronger and ripping atmospheres off even faster. Which takes us back to the faint young sun paradox, and asks why we definitely had lots of surface water by 4 billion years back and possibly even 4.4 billion years ago. Part of that is the planet was still very hot, things gain speed as they fall and when they collide and merge all that energy gets released as heat. During planetary formation that energy is huge and to give a conceptual scale, think about all the heat and flame in a rocket launch and remember that it is being used to speed something up to give the kinetic energy or escape velocity to get away from Earth, and anything falling down has to gain that same speed and energy as it falls. We also had a lot more uranium back then too and it's been decaying and warming the planet, though at an ever decreasing rate. The planet was molten hot for a long time after that collision that formed the moon and wasn't cold when that happened either. Remember most of the planet is still hotter than boiling water, just our thin crust isn't, and the core of Earth is hotter than the surface of the sun. There's a lot of heat and several thousand kilometers of rock and mantle is a lot of insulation. But it doesn't quite add up and that's part of the problem with determining atmospheric composition for that era. Some gases aren't gases at some temperatures, or like water vapor can exist in higher concentration at higher temperatures, others insulate better, some like carbon dioxide only have a gas and solid form, unless the pressure is several times what our current atmosphere is, in which case you have carbon dioxide lakes. All these options alter the heat loss rates of our planet and are hard to determine from 4 billion year old evidence that has repeatedly been blown up by volcanoes and asteroid impacts during that time when not being eroded by far stronger erosive conditions of early Earth. So geologists and physicists can be forgiven for not having a clear consensus on the matter yet. As another example, ammonia is a pretty good greenhouse gas and as mentioned it is very common in the universe being made mostly of mutually abundant elements of hydrogen and nitrogen, but it also does not do well when exposed to sunlight, particularly ultraviolet light. Hotter stars produce a lot more ultraviolet, so it was suggested by Carl Sagan and George Mullen that maybe that ammonia was around and keeping the planet warmer and as the sun kept on shining and brightening it slowly turned that ammonia into regular nitrogen gas, which is the majority of our modern atmosphere and hydrogen which would either have been bonded to oxygen to make more water or been blown away into space. They also suggested a non-specific photochemical haze could have better protected that ammonia. The numbers didn't seem to work out on this, we wouldn't have expected them to remain in quantity more than maybe 10 million years, and so the theory was for a time dismissed but others have recently argued that photochemical protection might have been possible after all. Now this goes back to the experiments by Stanley Miller in the 1950s where he was showing amino acids could form if you put electricity through a mixture heavy in ammonia and methane, and you've probably heard now that the Miller experiments are thought to have been wrong for the origin of life as it was shown the atmosphere couldn't have that mix, but again we're not really so sure about that either. We also don't know that we need methane and ammonia around and in the absence of free oxygen we might have got the same results simply from an atmosphere heavy in nitrogen and carbon which could come from molecular nitrogen and carbon dioxide as easily as ammonia and methane. Lots of unknowns about this primordial period and while we are getting close to good enough to look at the atmosphere of exoplanets and probably will find some young and earth-sized planets in the next couple decades to examine, 
it would be a pretty big jump to assume those paralleled how things were on Earth, even in fairly close matches of that planet to Earth and both having similar suns. Incidentally, this is the moment in writing this script back in December where I paused my typing to head into court for my adoption hearing for my three children, Christopher, Isabella, and Geometry, four months before this will air, but it seemed a good footnote to include, and I just got back from there and having cake and ice cream with my newly formalized family. It's also a decent excuse for a segue to the idea of us visiting and claiming new worlds, and specifically brand new worlds that still have the fresh car smell on them. Admittedly they probably reek of ammonia and methane so not really a car you would want to drive. First, we should probably assume nearly half of the Earth clones are going to be in this territory given that we had over 2 billion years before we got an oxygen atmosphere and don't expect it to last more than another billion or so years. I'm not sure if I'd call Earth still primordial at the 2 billion year mark though, but most stars will have planets and I would guess somewhere between 1-10% to of new star systems are going to have a rocky planet of something in the Earth mass range that's somewhere in the habitable zone of its star and has a basic atmosphere too. The atmospheres of these worlds will vary immensely in composition, but we would expect most to see high concentrations of hydrogen and helium still ebbing off, or be in a phase heavy in those hydrogen abundant molecules of water vapor, ammonia, and methane, or shifting to molecular nitrogen and carbon monoxide and dioxide. There is about 6-7 to seven new stars born in this galaxy every year and all with high metallicities, though most of those are red or orange dwarfs, and different conditions may tend to exist around these dim or stars with different spectrums and where a tidal locking of habitable zone planets might be more common. But each is likely to be highly prized as they emerge into a future settled galaxy. This is a gold mine for terraforming purposes and the question becomes if the planet is still hot enough on the surface that you need to utilize methods for cooling it for a couple centuries like we discussed in Winter on Venus, or if it has any real surface yet as it might be very volcanic and have very deep oceans. Potentially not just water oceans either, bigger and quarter planets might have seas of ammonia or carbon dioxide, but these will still be very good candidates for terraforming anyway and that solar system is likely to have a lot of bigger minor planets and dwarfs still around. Our solar system likely had a lot more planets before they merged, got captured as moons, ejected from the solar system, or eaten by the sun, and would have been an enormously rich prize for developing interplanetary civilization less interested in terraforming one planet than creating a large spacefaring local civilization. Or not so local, as these young systems typically come in tightly packed clusters. New stars also tend to form most densely near the core too, which is way away from us. Alternatively, around a thousandth of the stars in this galaxy are 10 million years old or younger and around 1% on an order of 100 million years old, so you won't have to search far to find primordial planets. They are not evenly distributed as stars tend to form in bubbles and stick together for quite a while, slowly dissipating from their packs as they orbit the galaxy and get perturbed when intersecting other systems. You wouldn't expect to find a lone young system but several dozen to a few thousand in an open cluster and often you're going to have them pretty tightly packed while waiting for some of the bigger stars to go supernova. The Hyades cluster is close, about 150 light years away, and is a roughly spherical blob with a core radius of about 10 light years and containing hundreds of stars, though many of those are in the larger tidal radius where stars can peel off and go their own way easier or the halo radius where they are already escaping the cluster. At 625 million years of age, it's not a very young cluster but it would also be past the age of Type 2 supernovae, though Type 1a supernovae are very plausible still as we know of at least 17 white dwarfs in there and 4 all conformed binaries. Supernovae can be devastating inside a radius of 30 or so light years and clusters in that size range can easily get zapped by multiple Type 2 supernovae then some Type 1a supernovae before they scatter into a wider area and it is quite likely that many primordial atmospheres get wrecked by those events, maybe even ours way back, which might help set the stage for future atmospheres that are more life friendly too. I mentioned we are on iteration 3 of our own atmosphere but that is more like the minimum number and back when our solar system was in a cluster it might have gotten whacked repeatedly too. Hyades is the closest open cluster to us but it's also close in the sky to the Pleiades, 
which is a bit over 400 light years away and is closer to 100 million years old, so very rich with primordial planets but also where a lot of young giants live like the Seven Sisters, and they are visible to the naked eye and its youngest and brightest member, Alcyone, is still 100 million years old and not big enough to go supernova. So this is another potential hub for some thousand system star empire within a light decade of a diameter. We'll talk about that more at the end of the month in multi-planetary empires, but these clusters are likely to be hubs of interstellar civilization and the Hyades Cluster is likely to end up as the closest rival to Earth for status as the core of a future sprawling civilization making its way out into the wider galaxy. The Pleiades would be an even richer strike, being bigger and younger. Clusters younger than this like the Orion Nebula or the Orion Trapezium Cluster or Pi Puppis Cluster would still be in their window for supernovae and represent an additional complication for settlement. This is generally what we mean by supernovae being a Fermi Paradox filter, they can happen to order planets passing near some other young star intersecting paths, and that could cause a mass extinction event and temporarily damage the atmosphere of a planet but would not wipe all life out unless it was improbably close. Mostly it's that early era when everything is packed in tight and you still have the young big stars or white dwarfs with binary partners close to everyone else. I could imagine civilizations going into open clusters early in the game and using star lifting or shikata thrusters or some of the other methods we've discussed to choke off potential supernova of any type or just boot the dying star out of the cluster as big heavy stars are the fastest and easiest to move with any of the stellar engine types we've discussed in episodes like Fleet of Stars or the Megastructural Compendium. As we noted in our recent episode on statites, that's not high tech, you can disassemble a couple of larger asteroids into materials able to reflect photons or ionize particles and get that star moving. So even young clusters are not hard nose for settlement. They are frequently going to have lots of red giants in them, which we've discussed before as an option for slowing very high speed spaceships that get sent out by pushing beams and need a freeway to slow down. Also those tight groupings of stars are going to offer some options for slowing down just by being compact and as you get nearer you are likely to be able to detect some black hole, if it has one, that you can slow down around too. Hence these might be your first places colonized in any region of a galaxy since you might be able to plausibly send spaceships toward them at a high fraction of light speed and slow them down, letting ships reach them tens or even hundreds of thousands of years before spaceships leapfrogging their way out system by system from Earth might arrive. A lone spaceship reaching one might have time to go to a civilization of a million worlds before it encountered the leading edge of the main expansion sphere out from Earth. In this way, primordial planets might become the homes to young empires out among the stars. So welcome to March here on SFIA and we have 8 episodes this month and we'll get to the upcoming schedule in just a moment, but this is actually our second episode for the month and every month we release an episode exclusively on Nebula, on the first. And this month's episode, Crystal Aliens, follows up our discussions of ammonia-based and silicon-based life forms from late last year, where we look at where and how crystals might serve as a building block for life, and look at five different hypothetical planets where it emerged using different evolutionary paths and mechanics. And again, Crystal Aliens is out now exclusively on Nebula, our streaming service, where you can also see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad-free, as well as our other bonus content, including extended editions of mini episodes and more Nebula exclusives, like last month's episode Topopolis, The Eternal River, January's Giant Space Monsters, December's episode The Fermi Paradox, Hermit Shop Little Hypothesis, Ultra Relativistic Spaceships, Dark Stars at the Beginning of Time, Life as an Asteroid Minor, Nomadic Minors on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, and more. Nebula has tons of great content from an ever-growing community of creators, using my link and discount it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during the episode. When you sign up by a link, go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur and use my code, Isaac Arthur, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, like Crystal Aliens, you'll also be directly supporting this show. 
again to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. This Thursday, March 7th, we'll continue our discussion of Terraforming from last month's episode on Terraforming the Moon by asking if and when Terraforming in general is ethical, and what sorts of challenges future civilizations will face in deciding whether or not a planet should be terraformed and to what degree. After that we'll travel toward Mars to look not at the red planet but instead at its two tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos, and ask why and how we could settle them. Then it'll be time for our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Automated Justice, for a 50 minute deep dive on the role of AI in our courts and justice system. Then we'll return to the Fermi Paradox on March 21st to discuss the evolutionary jump from simple to complex, and if that might be the solution to the big question of where all the alien life is. Then we'll finish our discussion of last month on black holes by deep diving Kugelblitz black holes and using them for power generation, before finishing out the month with a bonus Sci-Fi Sunday episode on the 31st, multi planetary Empires. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you'd like to donate or help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Crystal Aliens at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching and have a great week. <laughs>